So, dobrý večer. Good, good evening. My name is Přemysl Pala, I'm the director of the Czech Center and I'm really delighted to see so many of you here uh, this evening and welcome you in the next edition of the Women in Focus series. Uh, the program uh, introduces uh, inspiring women personalities and their accomplished professional journeys and aims to unveil through dialogue and open discussion the intricacies of various various fields. And I'm truly uh, delighted that today we have a very special guest, uh, Lady Milena Renfeld. Thank you. But Milena might not need the introduction to this uh, audience. Nevertheless, I would like to uh, to mention that she came to United Kingdom on the last uh, Nicholas Minton Kinder Transport train on the 31st of July 1939 from Czechoslovakia and stay in this country uh, ever ever since. Uh, I'll not I'm not going to go through the many. Uh, life milestones as I'm certain Milena will share them with you with her typically humorous way. However, I like to mention one important moment that is almost 50 years after uh, Milena entered UK uh, when she met at the famous BBC program that's live for the first time Nicholas Winton and since that uh, time their relationship has evolved uh, into true and dear uh, friendship. By the way, the story about Kinder transport uh, and the life of Nicholas Winton is beautifully captured recently in the film One Life that concluded the Czech Center Made in Prague Festival uh, last December and I see some faces that have joined us for the, for the screening of the gala, gala evening. So there is much more we can look forward uh, this, this evening as Milena is a woman of many virtues and professions, among them being interpreter, business woman, the lady uh, Remoska, or a chair <laughs> woman of the Friends of the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic uh, Orchestra. Uh, Lady Milena has also received uh, numerous accolades uh, such as Jan Masaryk, Gratis, uh, Agit, Czech Women of the Year, the Honorary University of Shire Fellow, a member of the Order of the British uh, Empire. So with that, before I turn the floor to, to Milena, let me just say that this evening is going to be divided into three parts. The first part uh, will be a talk and presentation uh, by Milena. The second part will be a, a, a dialogue, a discussion with Milena's friend, but also a claimed journalist, uh, Ivan Kitka, who's join us for the, for the second part. And the third part will be open for the discussion with, with you. So with that, enjoy the evening. And Milena, the floor is yours. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to show you a, a PowerPoint presentation. Normally, it takes uh, 45 minutes. It's one I do in schools, and I'm having to cut it down to 25. So there'll be one or two pictures that I shall mull over. So here goes. To England. For the children, there are trains. That's an opening chorus for The Last Train to Tomorrow, which was written by Carl Davis, who sadly died not long ago. And uh, these are children who are singing their trains to England. And I was on the last train that came to England.
I'm going to skip through some of these because a lot of it will not be something that you don't know about. These are pictures of the extermination camps that were scattered through Poland. As I say, I show these to schools and they need longer explanations, but all of you will, of course, know what you're looking at. Well, that's uh, 1938. My father, I was eight, and my sister, two and a half, walking through Prague. And the Holocaust Educational Association coined a special word for every year. And when I, see, when I show these words, I say to the children, you know them, trains, but these were trains that took people to concentration camps. Labels, labels that we wore on our necks when we were traveling. I'm going to stand up here. And I have that label here with me. I'm going to stand. Picture of Thomas Mann. The very reason my father had to leave the country because he was responsible for obtaining Czech passports for Thomas Mann, who was exiled living in Switzerland and couldn't travel. And uh, my father uh, admired his writing, suggested to our town they made him an honorary citizen. And Benesch sent him to Switzerland, offered Thomas Mann and his family Czech passports, which uh, he gratefully accepted, and with which he then traveled to America. And uh, on the way to, uh, my father was told he had to leave the country very quickly uh, because he would be arrested by the Gestapo. And he was told to go to Berlin where nobody would uh, find him. And on the way, on the, in the train, he met a lady who said that she will hide him for the night and ask her son to help him to leave the next day. And this is in 1939, on the 14th of March, the day when the Germans actually invaded the Czech Republic. Um, he, the, the man that uh, helped him to escape turned out to be a German officer who was a great admirer of Thomas Mann and put my father on the train. And my father met him 20 years later. There he is, he was found by, by uh, friends in Germany. Uh, he was called uh, Schreiber. And those of you who can read German, my father met the man that saved him again after 20 years. And that's how we looked when uh, we presume Nicholas Winton received our photograph uh, when my mother told us in May that we were to go to England. And uh, here's the very visa or non-visa, if you like, card that I had to carry when, when we traveled. <coughs> and you saw the card. And that was my sister when we arrived in Liverpool Street Station. Uh, she eventually went to America, became a headmistress, and in her 60s decided that she was Jewish because we were never brought up in the faith. Um, but she then uh, wrote a whole book of poems, and this is a wonderful poem about her label. And uh, she even had a bat mitzvah and uh, accepted her, her Jewish nationality. And my grandfather gave me an autograph book on the night we were leaving uh, Prague, and I have it here. And uh, for the English people who can't read Czech, it says, uh, remember to be a faithful daughter of the country that you're leaving, of your parents and your <coughs> grandfather, who loves you very much. And Prague, the 31st of July, nine o'clock in the evening, um, that's when we were put on the train and we left. And that's the rucksack that we carried <coughs> with us, which is now along with the trunk sitting in the Washington uh, Museum. My sister donated, donated both of those items there. 
And uh, I told the children that I had three books with me. And uh, for your English, I don't know whether any of your English people can recognize what they are. Anybody call out? Wind in the Willows, absolutely. I showed it to the children. And I didn't know I was carrying a Czech book, an English book with me. I had three. I had Wind in the Willows, I had Robinson Crusoe, and Uncle Tom's Cabin. And hands up of those of you who know what that is. <laughs> Four hands that go up. It's about, the, it's about the slaves. And of course, the children look totally blank. No idea what Uncle Tom's Cabin was until one little boy put his hand up. And he lived near Blackpool. He said, I know Uncle Tom's Cabin. It's a pub in Blackpool. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was Uncle Tom's Cabin. <laughs> and here we are at Liverpool <coughs> Street Station, where we were collected by a family called the Ratcliffs, uh, eventually to be called Daddy Ratcliffe, Mummy Ratcliffe, and Mary, who had a daughter. They lived in a, a terrace house, uh, two up two down, bath in the kitchen, loo in the yard, and they had a 16-year-old daughter. And because they didn't want to separate us, they sent their daughter to live with the grandmother so that we could live with them. And we were there for, with them for a year when miraculously um, my mother arrived in 1940, which was very rare, in February, and she came by Norway. And uh, many, many years later, I discovered that some archive, that the archives in uh, in Norway, uh, there is a document saying that my mother, uh, she arrived in Oslo in March 1940 from Prague, because at that time Norway was still unoccupied. But two year, two weeks after she landed in England, the Germans occupied Norway, so she was she was saved. So we were one of the few people, few children, that actually had parents in England, because most of those children, and I have to tell you, 10,000 uh, kinder transport children came from Germany and Austria in 1938. Now they just came and they were, came to camps, uh, they were distributed later, but we didn't come until 1939. And uh, before we could come, uh, and that of course, we come to Nicholas Winton now, Winton had to find <coughs> a family for all of us and uh, before, the, he, before he was allowed to bring us to England. So, uh, the, so this is a document, and my mother was very lucky that she was able to join us. Um, in 1942, the Czech uh, government in exile opened a boarding school for um, children, and because my father didn't want me to uh, forget my own language, I was sent to this boarding school. And when I told the children I went to boarding school, oh, Gosh, you know, that was very exciting. This looks very wonderful. It was a decrepit old manor house, which was literally had no heating, um, hardly any electricity. And when the ceiling fell down uh, a year later, we were eventually sent to Wales, to a village called Llanotid Wells, um, uh, where we spent the rest of our time. Um, and we loved it. And Llanotid Wells is twinned with Chesky Krumlov to this day because when we arrived there, it's right in the middle of the Brecon Hills. Um, hardly any English ever came there, and they saw this troop of foreigners arrive at school. And so, to make ourselves known, we decided to invite the villagers and uh, sang for them, sang a lot of Czech songs, that we finished off by singing in my homeland, Manadai, in Al Willy Me, which is the land of my father's in Welsh. And they adopted us immediately. And as I said, to today, they are twinned with Chesky Krumlov. And there's only one person I know alive still that remembers the school. I still visit the place. And the school has now been turned into an adventure school. Um, uh, but uh, they all remember the Czech students that were there. And, and there we are. The, and there's me, you can see, smiling away. We were like a big family. We loved it. I was a dreadful pupil. I, I'm going to say it in Czech. I said, Propadla ve škole. For those of you who don't understand, you had, to, you had to be good at everything at your subjects. And if you weren't 
good at them. You had the summer to swat up. And I loathe math Latin, and I can't count. And I failed in both subjects, and I had to sit in the same class twice, which is a terrible disgrace. But somehow I got over it. I, I know that one and one is not 11 anymore. <laughs> So, and I had my autograph book with me. And there we have Friends, 1943, uh, because when the school disbanded, um, <coughs> when the school disbanded, we stayed in touch, all of us, for many, many years. And uh, as I said, we were like a family. Now, um, that's like, I'm going through this very quickly because I have 25 minutes. So, uh, Forty years later, I get a telephone call, and this woman says, and I'm in the kitchen, you know, my place, um, this is Esther Anson. And my answer was, oh, I'm the Queen of England. <laughs> I, I thought a friend was joking, and she said, no, this is Esther Anson. I have in my hand um, a scrapbook belonging to a man called Nicholas Winton. Uh, Nicholas Winton, who organized the trains that you traveled on. And I am now 40 years on. I have almost forgotten what had happened to me. I'm married with children. Our parents never talked about the past. Uh, and this came as a total surprise. And uh, most of you have probably seen the clip of That's Life. Mm -hmm. But this is a piece of film that has never been shown in public because Esther Hansen is talking about the fact. I was that producing and presenting a program for the BBC called That's Life. It had a very big audience. We invited Mr. Nicholas I'm in the blue dress. to our studio without telling him that we were going to surround him with some of the people he'd saved. So we sat him in the front row and uh, we didn't tell him who was sitting either side of him. This is a picture of Nicholas Winton himself with one of the children he rescued. If you look at the very back of this scrapbook and uh, the moment came and I revealed to Nikki and to Vera that, that they were sitting next to each other. And it was absolutely magical. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. was the most important, most meaningful moment in my whole life because without him I wouldn't have been sitting there. Well, I, obviously, I mean, I show on the film how I felt everybody was in tears, even Esther. This is the only time in my whole career when I had to stop filming because I couldn't go on, because it was too moving. To hear about people like Mr. Winton and the foster families and the rescue committees I'm sorry, I've gone now. I'm terribly sorry. Um, Mr. Winton, have you still got that handkerchief? She, she stopped the filming at that point. It was never shown on the screen. But we got this little piece. I had to borrow, borrow Mr. Winton's handkerchief in order to, to, to carry on. Wipe my eyes and carry on. You said that. If there is anybody in the audience today who was on Nicholas Winton's list and knows their life in, would they stand up? Well, that was the yeah, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? And Nicholas turned round and saw the whole theatre standing up. Literally hundreds of people who owed their lives there. And Nicky's life was very ordinary and quite privileged before he started working with the children. There he is, skating, and he was also a very, very good fencer. And if it hadn't been for the war, he was about to fence in the Olympics, actually. There he is on the right-hand side, the right-hand fencing. <coughs> Married a Danish Danish lady, and there he is with his mum. So just a few shots of Nicholas as a young man. He then joined the Air Force, where he drove an ambulance in Dunkirk at first. 
and then joined the Air Force and became a flight instructor. And these are some of the Windermere boys that you may have heard of uh, that were brought over to England uh, after, the, after the war. And Nicholas, uh, to be able to bring children to England, had to make a list. And when he was in Prague in 1938, in 1939, January, um, he had 2,000 people outside his hotel begging him, please put our, name, our children's names on your list to get them to England. And so these are, this is a sample. There you can see our names with 42 Cedar Street, Ashton on the line, and Roman Ratcliffe, uh, 72 Alexander Street. 41 Cedar Street is where we eventually moved with my parents. And how could Nicholas uh, get children to England? He had to advertise. And this is a sample of a page out of the picture post. Who can remember picture post? Mm -hmm. There's a lady nodding her head here. Um, and this is picture post in 1939. And these are letters from, pe from people all saying, we will adopt and take a child. And uh, above there, what our readers say, they said they had thousands of letters that came to picture post willing to foster children. And that's how Nicholas was able to get us over to England.
Thank you all very much. I have been told that you've all been through, as I have, quite an experience this evening, and that it's really not the right time for me to make a speech, although my family are very afraid that I'm going to because I love talking. I'll leave you, however, just with only two words which you'll have to interpret, to interpret for yourselves. One is ethical. Ethics should be the background of all religions and should be a unifying factor in the world. And the other is compromise without which not even a marriage could exist. And although it's got rather a nasty feeling, unless we and everybody else leads an ethical life and are prepared to compromise, the future is only going to be bleaker than it seems to be at the moment. Thank you. Nicky loved flying. And when he was 104, I received a message from Prague to say that uh, friends were coming over in a four-seater Cessna. Would he like a flight? And his daughter said, well, you know, he's a bit frail, but he said, oh yes, he definitely would. And so I, we drove down to Maidenhead and took him to the city. And Barbara looked at this four-seater, it's like four chairs with an engine, and said, I'm not getting in that. And I climbed in behind him. And so we took off. And as we were flying, every plane has dual controls. And once we were in the air, the pilot calmly pointed to the ones in front of Nicholas, who nodded his head. And for half an hour, I was being flown by a 104-year-old pilot. <laughs> <laughs> because that's exactly what he did, he just took over. And uh, when the plane <coughs> landed, he got out and said, huh. Just like riding a bicycle, you'll never forget. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, taking off. That day, one of that him. I was sitting just behind him, ready. I think I had my eyes closed most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and he was a great Rotarian, and this happens to be a picture taken at home because there was a big conference in Blackpool a rotary, and he came and he stayed stayed with me. So um, he was a lovely, lovely man. When he died, within one month, the Czech Post published a stamp, and we thought that in England it was time that uh, something was done. Also, and we got in touch with the Royal Mail, and we were told it took about three years of. Uh, conferences before they decided whether they actually would publish a stamp of some someone known. And they did eventually publish it. I haven't got a picture of it, but it took three years before we got a picture of <coughs> Nicky uh, on a stamp in this country. But within one month, it was published in Prague. It was printed. And um, when he was uh, well into his 90s, he was being visited by one of us who had gone to school with him, with, with us, uh, who was living in Israel, uh, a man called Hugo Maron. And Hugo said, you know, Nikki, uh, you're famous. People know about us. But the heroes were our parents who put us on the train. And uh, it's time we had a memorial for them. And he said, yes. He said, they're not before time. But now there were not many of us left, and uh, there was a friend in Prague called Zuzana Marishova. And Hugo went back to Israel, phoned me and said, organize a memorial. How do you start? How do you get the idea? So we very quickly formed a little committee in Prague, Suzanne and I, and uh, we were advised to go for a competition, which we did, but we didn't like any of the designs. And Susanna said to me, you know, I remember being at the station and our parents waving goodbye to us. And I said, that's the memorial. And we found an artist who drew our idea of parents waving goodbye to the, parent, to the children. 
Um, and then we had to start uh, finding how it's going to be made. We found a man in Slovakia who copied trains, and he copied a door from a train back to 1940. And uh, we had to go public, we had to, uh, because people were giving us money you know, all, all, all over the place, so, so we had to find, or offer, uh, different various uh, glass engravers uh, the job of making a glass. And one of them so desperately wanted to make this. I mean, he offered a very little price. And so we have our memorial, which now stands on Prague railway station. And the little hands in the window are my great grandchildren, my great granddaughters, and the great grandsons of Susanna. And our own hands are the large hands that are on the front. We had to ask for money all over the place. And the biggest amount that was given to us by the most reviled man in the Czech Republic who gave us almost half the amount was Andrei Babish. <laughs> he never, we never, he wouldn't advertise it, never made it public. We didn't get a penny from the government. He came to the opening alone and um, uh, said he did. He wanted absolutely no publicity, but if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have had that memorial. He gave us almost half the money, and I say it didn't come from the government. I've had to cut this down very quickly, so thank you for your kind attention. Um, and uh, 25 minutes. Right at that. <laughs>Thank you, Milena. <clears throat> what a fascinating story, what, what, what a lady tonight. <laughs> I have to admit, as a journalist, I, I did quite a few interviews with Lady Milena in the last 28 years we know each other, and each time she's able to surprise me with something really touchingly human and unexpected, and always with a nice joke as well. Thank you for that, Milena, as well. Um, we spoke mostly about, or you spoke mostly about the time when you arrived to Britain and, and to Nicholas Swinton, but there is another almost 80 years to cover, so I don't know how we do it in five or ten minutes, but tell us, um, you always kept a very close relationship to the Czech Republic, even in the times when it, there were dark times in former Czechoslovakia. You, audience didn't know but you speak perfect Czech and you can write perfect Czech much better than some other uh, Czechs I, I knew here in this country. What was it what, what made you to be so close to Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic? Well, f first of all, I think it was the family. I know my, we, although we never came back, never went back, uh, my father would have done but very quickly when we realized the political situation um, we decided to stay in England. Uh, but I always, uh, in my soul, I think, I think it's the soul and music and, and culture, you know, for Czech, but we adapted to, we, we adapted very to, to live like English people. And my, my mother was a doctor, my father was an accountant, and we became absolutely English. My sister did forget, she was only three, um, and she, within the year that we were living with the English family, she she did forget, but she has relearned Czech. No. If I'm not wrong, first time you you were able to come back to what was Czechoslovakia was it in the 60s, and you came as, a, the, as the, an interpreter for English Chamber of Commerce to promote Czechoslovak English. No, it was before that. Actually, the very first the very first time we came back was in '59, and we were actually driving through Yugoslavia. We were going down to a place called Petrovac Namoru and intended to drive back through the Czech Republic. And uh, when we came back through Vienna, I mean, it was Yugoslavia, then it was quite different. Uh, and on the border, my two elder daughters that were with us said to me, pretend you can't speak Czech, which was a silly thing. So I just sat there, and uh, the two guards looked at my passport and said, tak co? Mama je pustit nebo je máme nechat the, the, uh, <coughs> Should we let them go? Should we let them sweat? That was a question. 
So we drove to Prague, and at that time, we could only visit friends in hotels. We couldn't go to their homes. We were there for four days. But later on, um, yes, I became, I came back to Prague as an interpreter for the London Chamber of Commerce. Um, and uh, then when 89 happened, and by now we had Libor Peshek conducting in Liverpool, Liverpool Philharmonic, we started traveling to Czechoslovakia at the time. I suppose 20 times over 20 years I've taken groups there for music and festivals, uh, the Chopin Festival, Praskaya, yes, Praskaya. We were we. The Phil was the first foreign orchestra that actually opened uh, the Prague Praskaya with Libor Peshek, and Havel came to that performance. Right. And uh, we've got a photograph here. Yeah, we'll show it a few minutes later. Okay. I just maybe yeah. we should mention that the driver who took you to the Czech Republic in 1959 was your husband. Sir George, would you tell us how did you meet him and he got married in 1954? The reason for that is that he was one of the leading English architects, very distinguished architect who uh, made your life rich, obviously. Well, uh, I, met, I met George after I, after I left school. I came home, trained as a nursery nurse and then au pair, it went to France for two years and au pair in France, came back and uh, my, husband, my father said he'd met a very interesting man, who was George, uh, who was older than I was, an architect, and uh, married, we married. Um, and I very quickly sort of uh, started, well, he knew I was Czech. Um, and we were the very first firm that was able to employ Czech architects in England. We got permission to, to bring them over. And then we drove to we drove to Prague uh, a number of times. Um, we drove right through the country, took lots of photographs. Um, his firm was an unusual firm. It was a firm that shared. It was a that shared um, all the income. Cooperative. Uh, it, yes, it was a sort of cooperative firm. That's right. For many many years, um, he lectured uh, uh, all over Europe. He spent two months lecturing in Russia. And that was interesting because he wrote back and every letter came back within three or four days, which was most unusual. And my daughter at the moment is now tra transcribing them all. And uh, the only time he got stopped taking photographs was twice. And once was uh, outside a bank where there was the uniformed man, uh, like a guard who s stopped him. And once um, in an airport, which is not very surprising, really. But on the other hand, he was at Baikal, and they were building a new factory. And he asked if he could photograph it, and they lit it up for him. <laughs> um, everywhere he went, he had absolutely no problems. He went to Akadem, got her up. And uh, his last, uh, his last uh, town was uh, still Leningrad. And he was walking outside at night, and um, he was stopped by a total stranger. A man stopped him. He could see he was, he, he, the Russian could see he was stopping a foreigner. And he spoke a little English. And when my husband explained to him that our eldest daughter had married a Frenchman, he said, she is allowed? And he said, yes. Ah, uh, he said, Englishmen are free. And that really was the last letter he wrote when he came home, that was the last sentence, the Englishman <coughs> were free, that yeah. he had a wonderful trip around. It seems to me that you are a very adventurous family because one of your family trips, holiday trips, was to uh, the Soviet Union, to the country which is now facing Russian invasion in Ukraine. Tell us about your trip to Odessa and actually what, what was so attractive for you guys well, well, that, crossing that, that, the Iron well, Curtain? Uh, I can tell you when when he was in when he was in Russia, he came across two students uh, who wanted to buy his camera, and uh, he wasn't going to do that. And uh, and they came back and corresponded. My 16-year-old daughter then corresponded with the student, and George decided that we would go on holiday because we had a Yugoslav architect who who was a friend who tried to persuade us to go there. So we he looked at the map, and he said, uh, 
Or we'll go to Odessa. We'll drive to Odessa. Uh, By car. 1962, I think. And uh, he thought, Preston, Munich one day, uh, Munich, Ljubljana next day, Petrovas Namoru the third day. Uh, sorry, I'm mixing the two countries. This, this is Odessa here. Um, it took us more than a week to get there, actually. It wasn't quite as simple as we thought. But uh, when we were driving back, it was interesting. Uh, we had to park the car once we were in Odessa. We couldn't just use it to go around. But we're driving back. We exited through the wrong road in a village somewhere in Russia. And within five minutes, the motorcycle police caught up with us, very polite, telling us we were on the wrong road. And the kids couldn't understand how did they know. And when they got us back into town, outside every village and every town, there were lookout posts. And in those days, there were not many foreign cars trailing around Russia. And they could see us go in, but when they didn't see us go out, they sent out a search party <laughs> to see where we were, to put us back on the right maybe, road. Maybe I can share with, with you one secret. Uh, Milena is still a keen driver, and she just passed her extra driving test for another was two five years. years. I've just been given another two years. I'm not telling my order. Yes. <laughs> uh, maybe we can speak about your love for Czech music, because it's a this year Czech, uh, Czech Center That's music, right. uh, year of, of Czech music. Um, did you play any instrument at the school you showed us? No, right no I wanted to sing. I wanted to okay. sing, but I didn't play anything. But what's wonderful, uh, only yesterday I was in Liverpool, and because there was a reunion of the Merseyside Youth Orchestra, a young orchestra with, they were celebrating, I think, 60 years. But I used to travel with them 20 years ago. I was known as a mum. And uh, a young timpanist prior to that was a young boy called Simon Rattle. Wow. Simon Rattle, who was with us yesterday, who lived with Peshek 10 years in Liverpool. <laughs> Simon Rattle has now become the guest conductor of the Czech Philharmonic. And he was, as a young boy, a timpanist in the Merseyside Youth Orchestra. And uh, there was Simon yesterday conducting the orchestra. And we shall be seeing lots of him. And of course, the Czech connection is married to, to Magdalena Kožená. And uh, so somehow Liverpool and the Czech Republic, there's always been yeah. a, a great special Czech, connection. Yes. Special yeah. connection there. Um, you didn't mention, or I, I didn't mention, that you also met all four Czech presidents. You met once or twice the late Queen Elizabeth. You also sold Revolska to current King Charles. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know whether, well, I think most of you, most of the Czech people know what a Revolska is. It's a cook pan, okay? It's a cook pan. And it's very practical, it's very cheap, it cooks a lot better than most, most ovens, and uh, we introduced it to England quite a few years ago. And when you were listening to the um, song, The Last Train to Tomorrow, it was being performed at the Roundhouse, and Prince Charles was there. And it was in November, and the Czech Remoska people had sent me a new one for his birthday. So I had to ask permission whether we could give it to him. So it had to go through the you know, like go through the airport to, to, to be, you know, through, through this... Security um, gate. Uh, yeah, security gate. Security, that's right. And uh, in the interval, uh, we, he came out and a few of us were standing around and I gave him the box and thank you very much, you know. And he uh, <laughs> said, uh, 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 so thank you for my lamp, he said. But three, uh, a few weeks later, we got a very nice letter to say that the Remoska was in the kitchen. Oh. You know, in, in, some, in the kitchen. But the second time, he did. In, he does invite survivors every year to St James's Palace for afternoon tea, and uh, survivors and people like us, some of the train children. And one year when he came, uh, I had back in in the Czech Republic a cousin who had survived three concentration camps, one of the few relations, who eventually became a very very famous harpsichord performer, Kozuzana Ruzicková. 
and she had just recorded a complete works of Bach and uh, I had them with me and I gave them to Prince Charles and three weeks later she phoned me to say that he had written to her and, and uh, Sam thanked her. Yes, so fascinating. That was very good, yes. Did you ever have a, a favourite member of the royal family? <laughs> well, well, actually, this book, I've just shown you, I sent it to Camilla, and she's written back and said thank you very much, because I thought you could <laughs> give it to her, her grandchildren as well, yes. How about Czech presidents? You met all of them? Well, we met, we them. met, have you got this picture of Havel? Sorry? The picture of Havel. Oh, where, yeah. So where is behind it? Behind us. Oh, a letter from Havel. <laughs> Yeah, this is probably, uh, I'm not sure how... Is it how upside far. down? No? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah that, was, that was actually the night when the Liverpool Phil played, uh, played in, uh, in Prague. And uh, that's in the green room. And then some of you whom I remember, there was a, on the on the Rutava, there was a restaurant, like a floating restaurant. Uh, there were a few nodding heads. And all the orchestra went down to have a party and Harold came, came with us to that party, yes. Yeah. I should probably mention that you also had met the latest chief president. You just came back three weeks ago from Prague, is yes, it correct? Yes, uh, you, I don't know how many of you have seen the film uh, One Life. And the premiere was in Prague uh, just over three years ago, so three days, three weeks ago. And um, <coughs> Peter Pavel came mm -mm. and spent the entire week, uh, evening with us. Uh, talked to us, sat through the film, came to supper, and he's a very nice, very nice man, I have yeah. to say. Perhaps our last question for me, you are well known as a brilliant networker. Uh, if there are networkers in this in this hall, what, what's, what's the secret of, of being a brilliant networker? How do you connect people naturally? It's, it's not what you know, it's who you know, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just pass the name round. Mm. Yes. I guess. <laughs> okay, um, time for the questions from, from you, audience. Oh, uh, yeah. Just, yeah, you have to shout out because I'm a bit deaf. Thank you. Lady Malena, we've gone through many decades, but I just want to take you back to that train ticket that you showed us which had number 638 on it, I think. Is that how many children were on the train? No, my number... Um, it has 638 or 639 on the top left-hand corner. 641. 641. So well, what was a train like with 640 was on, I was on, Mine was the last train. There were 669 children altogether. I, I really... It's 80 odd. I really can't remember physically you know, what it was like. Uh, I did meet someone back at school who said that she was in the same compartment and she said, as the train was leaving, we held hands and we said, Nebudeme brechet, we're not going to cry. Nebudeme But that's, that's the only memory I have. Uh, and of course we traveled right through the night on, on into Holland. And the other thing that a lot of people talked about between them, and it's been written up elsewhere. When we were in Holland, and we were then put on this big ship on the sea, and the first thing we were given was tea with milk. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody liked tea with milk. <laughs> and the other thing was white bread sandwiches. And we all wanted our Czech bread, you know. And food, food is a sort of memories you have because I know the English people, the family we lived with, Mummy Ratcliffe, was a very good cook. And I, and I remember plum pies and Yorkshire pudding with syrup. I remember playing a game called Kick Can out in the street. And Ashton Underline is a very Lancashire town. And I remember the market and people eating tripe and onions. And I hate to try, you know. Yeah. Uh, so these were sort of memories that stay in your mind. Another question? Yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for a lovely talk. Um, my question pertains to what are your memories of Prague before you left? 
Do you have any impressions? I know that you were quite small, but I'm sure it must have been. My memories of Prague itself, none really, except I do know that my grandfather used to take me to um, the children's um, theatre. And I know that on Kandravaske Namiesti, there was a shop that sold very, very good Bramborove Platske, <laughs> potato cakes. But, and I used to go to Sokol in Vishehrad, I remember that. Like that. Um, and because I've been back, and I've been back to the street, you know, to look at the house, uh, I must have gone to school nearby, but apart from that, I really remember nothing, nothing of the city. I mean, uh, I did talk about this memory business with a psychiatrist, because I was, and he said, uh, you, it's not surprising that you cannot remember after all these years. You know. I mean, some, some children do, did, but in my case, um, nothing, some of them, far worse things happened, particularly the ones who left in, to, you know, from Austria and Germany. They went through the Kristallnacht, they went through the German occupation, they went through the, the, the business of their father being taken away and arrested. See, n none of the nasty things really happened to us. So I sometimes feel um, sort of a bit guilty that I'm sort of telling this story when, when there are lots of other people who could tell you probably worse things than, than I can. Mm. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. I'm just amazed how incredibly eloquent and sprightly you are and I hope I'll be I'll live as long as you and have the brains that you have. I was just curious if um, at the time you were on the train, you knew of Nicholas Winton, or whether you got to know of him later on? No, it was 40 years. The That's, first time yes, I got to know yes, any of us got to know about him was when Esther Ranson found him. Yes, absolutely. It was, no, no one else knew. And what amazed me was in his, in his scrapbook, we found my father's business card. So we worked out finally, because my father was already in England, in March. Nicholas had been to Prague in the January. So it's quite possible for my father might have known what was happening, sent a message, but to, to us it was a total mystery. Thank you. Hi, uh, Lady Milana, thank you very much for, 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 for this. It's so, all so very interesting. I wanted to ask, uh, as you mentioned, that you're, uh, you're walking uh, or visiting schools and you're uh, telling your story to, uh, to children. Uh, I would be curious, uh, how, how do the children in general respond or what, what age and what are they maybe the most interested in? And uh, I spoke lately with uh, Nick Winton, the son of Sir Nicholas Winton, and I know he mentioned that it's very difficult and he's always thinking about how to best uh, uh, transmit the experience and uh, explain it to the children. So I would be very interested to well, see. I've how been, I've been going to school now for 10 years, really. <laughs> but we always insist, this is through the Holocaust Educational Trust, mostly. And the children have to be told something beforehand. You can't just tell the story code. The youngest ones are 11 and 12. And it's surprising, and they ask the most questions. They, I've, I've got hundreds of letters from the children, and I use one, and I'll show uh, one sample one, and this is from an 11-year-old girl. And she writes to say that she had a three-year-old brother at home, and she helped her mother sometimes, and she couldn't understand how I could look after my sister all that way. That when she went on a camping holiday for a week, she was homesick. And she couldn't understand how we were not homesick for our parents. And I sometimes say to the children, do you ever say I hate you to your parents? And they put their hands up. And when you asked us about our parents, I treasure my parents lots because I have parents to treasure. And that's a letter from an 11 year old child. And I do have lots of letters and the teachers do comment. Uh, the teenagers are, don't like asking questions. They, they do afterwards in class. Uh, but I get comments from the teachers that they, and I notice they all really sit and sit and listen. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we, we, I've got five schools uh, 
mm -hmm. next week. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're constantly asking you to come. I'm even going to football academies. Which <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. actually brings me with, with oh, there is another question that I was I was about to talk about football, but can't. <laughs> thank you so much. I wanted to ask you about um, something a little bit different. The conversations that you had with your friends in the 1950s when you visited Czechoslovakia. You mentioned they had to go to the hotel. I just wanted to ask about that, how that felt to speak to people who stayed and perhaps experienced a different regime uh, than you did when you stayed in England. I'm not sure what the question is. About uh, the conversations that you had with people uh, in Czechoslovakia in 1959 when you visited. When you were crossing the border. Oh, when we came the first time. Yeah. Um, we could only meet our friends in hotels, you mean. Um, well, it was very restricted. I mean, my, my father actually traveled back a lot, and I was often surprised he was never arrested, because he used to stay at the Akron, and uh, he was very outspoken uh, when he used to travel to Prague, because we had, we, we had friends there. But uh, it was, we, there were friends and relations, and we just greeted them. It was a very simple conversation. But when I was there, as an interpreter for the London Chamber of Commerce. And again, I was there for um, when they allowed computers. The first time they allowed computers to be shown in Prague. These were, these were big rooms that were um, air conditioned. Um, a year ago, when some of the documents were, the, the, the communist documents came to light, we found a whole, friends of mine, a whole pile of reports about me, about every conversation, every telephone uh, conversation I had during the time I was there as the interpreter. <coughs> because that was still in the communist days, when they first allowed the London Chamber of Commerce to, to have, uh, to have uh, exhibitions in Prague. And I've got pages and I, 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 can't, I can't believe it. Yeah. We can still come to football 1996 to Euro 96. Uh, you were basically hosting the Czech team, the, the Czech coach in, in Preston. They were your guests in a way, and the Czech team made it to the final. How did it happen that you, you, you lured the, the Czech national representation to, to Preston? Because obviously they had to. <laughs> Actually, the, uh, the Football Association. Uh, sent the various teams to various towns. And it was by pure chance that the Czech team was sent to Preston and housed in a very nice hotel uh, just up the road, if you like. And as soon as I heard there was a Czech team there, <coughs> we went to see the manager. Um, and I wanted to find out. And they brought their own chef with them. And I said, had they got enough Ruba Moka, you know, because, uh, <laughs> because uh, at that time you couldn't get the Czech flour. And he said he'd brought a, a good supply. But the, but the Czech team were very popular. They were right next door to a, a junior school, and they used to kick, kick the ball around, you know, on the field. I mean, a um, lot of the teams, I believe, kept themselves very much themselves. And I had a wonderful butcher who said to me, do you think they would come to a barbecue? And Mr. Uhrin, who was the trainer, said, well, if they play well in the next two weeks, I would allow it. <laughs> and so the ho two coaches and, and the butcher lived in a little village. We drove out, and we had this wonderful barbecue there. And he said, to this day, it's the best day of his life mm -hmm. when he had the Czech team having a barbecue in the kitchen. And on that day, all the wives arrived because they were allowed to, to come. And I remember all these ladies turning up at the barbecue, sort of in their high heels, looking rather, oh, you know, uh, uh, they were wondering they what... vegetarians? Well, they were <laughs> vegetarians. But they were sort of uh, slightly apprehensive uh, at the, uh, at the, at the e easiness of the event. And I was then asked to take the wives out for the day on the the. the Day the boys are playing, so we or we got a coach into the Lake District, which is not far, and it was a beautiful day. And two of the mothers came. Mr. Schmitz's mother came, and uh, and another another, and and they they thought it was wonderful. But these girls, 
oh, they were looking for shops. And we were on the lake, you know, <laughs> sa sailing away on, on Lake Windermere. And there was this and there's a nyaki or curry, With your help and with your support, the Czech team did it, made it to the final in 1996. Do you, uh, have you managed, did you manage to go and watch the, foot, the final? Yeah. yeah, well, I'd never seen a football match before. But I have to say, we went to all the matches. And my biggest memory of the final was meeting Placido Domingo. <laughs> because he was there. Was not playing football. Not playing football. <laughs> but, but I remember, yes, very sadly, most of you know they, they lost, but they lost in the. Uh, Germany. Yeah, but it was, it was not in the play, it was in the. Um, extra time. Extra time. Oh. It was in the extra time. And the entire stadium were wanting the Czechs to win. It was, it was so obvious. Yes. Yeah, because the Germans beat the English. Yeah, the Germans yeah. beat the English, and this was the final. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes, and I remember Poborski then came to Manchester um, and um, they were given a, a house to live in and uh, Mrs. Poborska told, was told that she could go and uh, go shopping, whatever she needed for the house. And she spoke no English, so um, I went with her and we went to this huge uh, uh, sh shopping mall and she said, I love this, I love this. I love this. <laughs> just, just, uh, they were just given the carte blanche to furnish the house as they wanted. But um, he then went, and there was Poborski was in Manchester, and two of the guys joined Liverpool mm. in there, yes. Mm. In, incidentally, a Czech team, Sparta Prague, is playing in Liverpool in probably one or two weeks, so if anyone wants to follow Czech football, <laughs> there is a great, great chance. Okay. Any more questions, please? Um, so Sir Winston, I guess, parted on two words um, in one of the videos with the, and from, I guess, with the orchestra. Um, based on your past experiences throughout your life, what would your two words be? My two words? Yes. <laughs> That's the crust of the question. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> Love your fellow man. Love your fellow man. Do, do we have any any other questions or shall we thanks to, yeah thanks you have any, what are your or do you have any diet tips or <laughs> <laughs> recommendations that, we could, that will let us know your for diet, diet trips <laughs> don't eat <laughs> I have to say that, that Milena, Lady Milena, apart of anything else, is also a very good cook. She's an author of a uh, Fremovska recipes published here in, in Britain. So. Well, you don't need any recipes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you actually got one. Oh my goodness. They've just built a new factory, in fact. <laughs> uh, in, they've just built a new factory and the new, the new Remoskas Wonderful because you can use it either with a Remoska lid or on electricity or on gas or in the oven. It's got three different lids with it and um, it's very good. I, I went to the opening. Taking all this for new Remoska. I really would like to thank on behalf of everyone for the really multifaceted evening. We covered sport, cooking, uh, of course, the early journey here. And it's been really a delight and pleasure. Thank you very much you. for joining us. Thank you, of course, to all of you for, for joining us. I think you're going to have some time also to sip a glass of wine. And uh, if you enjoyed this evening, we'll continue with this series, Women in Focus. Uh, the next one will be actually in April. And we're going to have a guest, Kamila Kupšina. Some of you might know her. She is the rabbi at the Westminster Synagogue. But before April, we're going to have a number of another events which have run on the loop. Just next week, there's going to be a 
film, is there any place for me, please? Um, she's on Wednesday on the 6th and the 12th. Uh, we're gonna have, I think, wonderful evening dedicated to Patrick Svetana, to his life and work. So you are all invited to join us also. So thank you again. Have a good evening.